in the not too distant future. Following the rapid succession of World Wars 3 and 4, plus the hidden horrors of secret World War 2, there's not much left. All that remains is a place where folks get together to read and discuss comic books. Sometimes they laugh, sometimes they argue, but they always record and upload their transmissions. You've found one of those transmissions today. Welcome to The Last, Last Comic Shop. Shop. People often ask me how the world ended, whether it was with a bang or with a whimper. And all I can say is, first they came for the drive-ins and nobody said anything. Next, they took the arcades and still, folk stayed silent. Then it was the video rental establishments, the record shops, and the toy stores. And still, they said nothing. By the time they got to the local comic book shops, there were no nerds left to say anything. Except for us! We're the last comic shop, raging against the dying of the light, sending our broadcasts back into the days of futures past in hopes that our comic book reviews might alter this cold, gray reality in which comic shops are nothing but a long-forgotten memory. So heed our words and go to your local comic shop. Pick up either of the book we'll be reviewing today or any number of countless comic book treasures before Before it's it's too too late. late. And I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson, and welcome back to another week of The Last Comic Shop. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Chad Smith. So, Chad, since we're doing a gangster book on today's uh, broadcast, what is your favorite gangster-related movie? All right, this is where I reveal my lack of gangster cred. Because I'm not going to go with the traditional, like, Scarface or uh, Goodfellas, although they're both uh, fine, fine films. Uh, uh, my choice is going to be The Untouchables. Okay. Sean Connery, don't bring a knife to a gunfight, and <laughs> all that stuff. No, it's a good movie. There's a lot of... Uh, the most interesting thing about that movie, I feel, is when I was in a, a film class in college, I had to watch uh, Battleship Potankin, uh, okay. which is a uh, silent movie, and how um, they basically took that the scene of the baby carriage going down the steps exactly that's from he, that movie. And so we'll come up later when we talk about homages. Yeah. There's, I, I like that one scene when they're um, shaking down the, the people that are coming across the Canadian border. I always thought that was a great scene. Like Kevin Costner is really good in that. And um, it's only the four of them. I think it's Andy Garcia and the guy with the glasses. And I wore glasses <laughs> and I was like, I like that guy. He's my... Uh-huh. I just loved it. I don't care how true it was. It, 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 it made my... Whenever I said I was like 12 years old, I was like, this is awesome! I want to get a Tommy gun and a trench coat. Is that Brian De Palma? Did he direct that? Or it is, else? yes. Yeah, it's Brian De Palma. Uh, speaking of another great uh, Brian De Palma movie, if you've never seen Carlito's Way, that's an underrated little gem uh, starring Al Pacino. Uh, J.A. Scott is my other co-host on today's program. J.A., What's your favorite gangster-related movie? Well, I'm going to stay in the same era of Untouchables, and also uh, similar to the book we are reviewing today, with The Irish Mob, and go with Miller's Crossing. Ooh! Great Coen Brothers film. Yes! Nice choice. That's a great, great movie. That's, um... Oh, who's the guy that, that the Coen brothers throw all the work at? He was in Oh Brother Where Are John Turturro. John Turturro. Oh, there John you go. Turturro. Yeah. Purple Jesus. <laughs> yes. Yes. If it's a Coen brothers movie, you know John Turturro is not too far behind. But why do you like Miller's Crossing so much? Great story. It's really well done, really well shot. Some beautiful scenes. And also, uh, John Polito has a starring role in that. Don't give me the hi hat! <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Lordy. Somebody that gives me the hi hat all the time is my wonderful wife, Nicole Larson, and she's on this week's episode. And uh, Nicole, what is your favorite gangster related movie? Uh, how about Dangerous Mind? <laughs> <laughs> Living in a gangster's paradise. That's true. Money cool. and the power. Power and the money. <laughs> I, <laughs> is is Coolio <laughs> even in that movie, or is he just in the video? I don't even think Coolio's in there. I I don't know. Does that count? It's a pretty gangster movie. <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's, gangsta, not a gangster. But I think I if think that we'll, song we'll is in there. It. It's Coolio's in it. <laughs> that makes it way Coolio. Yeah, my, my favorite part of that video is always like the Michelle Pfeiffer coming into the classroom and, and, and turning the turning the chair around and sitting down in her leather jacket. Let me level with you. <laughs> like, she's the toughest thing on this side of the block because I can speak some Shakespeare to you. Let me level with you, kids. This will keep you off the H and the drugs. <laughs> Wow. And no, it's I, I am I am appalled and shocked and and just disappointed with everybody today. The greatest gangster movie of all time is The Godfather. You said favorite, not the best. It, it's the my favorite. It's the best. It's the one of the greatest movies of all time. It is the only movie that's like close to three hours, which I can still watch. Every single time they put it on AMC, even though like it takes five hours with the commercials, I'm just like, no, I'll, I'll watch Godfather again. I, I'm not a huge fan of Godfather two, but Godfather, I like Godfather two almost better. You are one of those folks, and I got nothing to say to you other than that movie does not have a lot of James Con, and that's what makes Godfather the best. Who's James Con? Sonny. Sonny, no. he's the best part of that he has movie. Weird shoulders in that. Movie. Like, you're like weird. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like and then he's in the white beater they're like sticking out and it's like, it's like they don't belong on his body i don't know oh lord and yes nicole alone. nicole is 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 laying down some hard truths <laughs> that's it and when Apollonia dies and they blow her up, it's, it always brings a tear to my eye. It's it's a great, great movie. And, and if you're not going to give me that one, then I would have to say I, I'm a huge, huge fan of the original Public Enemy from, like, what, 1931 with James Cagney. That's, like, a really great one. If you've never seen Public Enemy where he shoves the grapefruit in the girl's face, that's a great gangster movie way before its time. So. That just sounds mean. That's mean-spirited <laughs> right there. And the thing was, James Cagney was a song and dance man. <laughs> Anyways, we've got more of The Last Comic Shop coming up here. These messages, I promise we're going to talk about comics, not movies. Well, I, I actually, I'm yeah, not. Aren't we talking about a movie? <laughs> yes, we are. We're talking about the comic book version of Road to Perdition, which was the what movie was based on, which is actually a comic book. Ad. Anyways, we're going to get to that right after these messages. Learn your words. <laughs> I've had a little of a drink. Hey everyone, Brian Thomas here from the former The Batman vs. James Bond show and the upcoming The Night Cave show. Do you like noir, black and white, gritty murder mysteries? Do you like crime stories or even pulp comics? Then you're going to love Nick Palatichuk's debut graphic novel entitled The Greenway. It's 1968, and Butch Schultz, a black market merchant, finds that his friend has been murdered in a mansion in St. Paul. Now he is out looking for who did it, while the city's best detectives are on the case. Nick's graphic novel is already getting rave reviews, let me tell you. Zero Supervision Comics Podcast says, a dark, intriguing story that makes you want to know more. The Glenn Think Stuff Podcast says, it's explosive, captivating, and alluring. And actor Kyle Hester from The Chair, Zombie with a Shotgun, and Preacher Six says, can't wait for this book. You got to get on this. Order your copy today at Indie Planet, A New World of Comics. That's www.indieplanet.com. Hard copies and digital copies are available, and now digital copies are only $5. That's where I said it, just $5. So make sure you order yours today. All right, we are back with more of The Last Comic Shop. And uh, on today's program, we're going to be reviewing a comic book that a lot of people don't know was actually uh, the influence of a pretty famous movie from the... This is like mid to late 2000s. I'm, I'm not 100% yeah. sure when I it was. I would say 2003 or 2004. Yeah. It, it, 2002. There you go. It was. Oh. Uh, it's called Road to Perdition. 
And most people do know it from the uh, Tom Hanks gangster movie starring uh, Paul Newman, I think, and maybe Paul Newman's last role uh, on screen, as well as Daniel Craig's in that movie, Jude Law's in that movie, Stanley Tucci is in that movie. I love Stanley Tucci, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Directed by Sam Mendes, which I got to say, I, I forgot that he directed it. And uh, as somebody that loves Skyfall, thinks that's one of the favorite James Bond movies out there, uh, it's kind of cool that he directed Daniel Craig long before he got to the James, Fran- James Bond franchise. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we're not really talking so much about this movie. Mm. We're talking about the comic book that inspired because again some people don't know that there was a comic book out there that you can pick up at your local comic book shop and uh, read for yourself so we'll be recovering road to perdition the comic book and as always uh chad who wrote and drew the uh, road to perdition comic book so the road to perdition is written by Max Allen Collins, who I first came across when he was writing Batman comics back in the day. But he's also a known uh, like crime novelist. Uh, he's written some G.I. Joe stuff, too. And the art is done by Richard Pierce Rayner, uh, who is a Russ Manning Award winner, who has done this and, I want to say, some Hellblazer comics and not a whole lot else in the comic book realm. Okay. And when was uh, this uh, the comic book uh, version of Road Perdition released? 1998, according to Wikipedia. Okay. Now, now I, I know that nowadays you can get this comic book through, I think, Vertigo. But was it originally a Vertigo book? It was published uh, through DC Comics uh, proper, but they're indent of Paradox Graphic Mysteries. Okay. So it's like a small subset where they would let uh, artists have a little bit more creative control. Well, quickly, let's get the 10 cent synopsis for the comic book version of Road to Perdition from our uh, other co host, J.A. Scott. So, J.A., what happens in the comic book version for those people that are only familiar with the movie? So, Road to Perdition is set during Prohibition. It uh, takes place in 1930 in a small town outside of Chicago in the Midwest. And the protagonist, Michael O'Sullivan, is a soldier for the Looney crime family, which is uh, a Irish mob tied to the Capone mob in Chicago. So they control smaller cities in the Midwest and the money gets funneled up to the big mob in Chicago. Michael O'Sullivan has a family and he's uh, portrayed as a nice family man. His son wants to find out what dad does hides in the back seat when uh, the father goes out on a job with the son of Mr. Looney, the head of the Looney crime family, Connor. And during this job, many murders happen. The son witnesses all of it, and this is the spark that starts the entire book. Basically, the Looney family and Connor, who's crazy, thinks that he needs to kill everyone in the O'Sullivan family because the son witnessed this murder. He only ends up killing his younger son and wife, while the older son, the son who actually witnessed his father doing all the dastardly deeds, survives. So then the book and uh, the plot is for the father to find safe haven for the son while avenging the death of his wife and child. Long story short, he drives around the Midwest shooting up and killing a lot of people. (laughs) He ends up killing (laughs) Mr. Looney. He kills Connor Looney. Uh, he kills a lot of the Capone family. There's some bank robbing involved. It's a good old 1930s gangster shoot 'em up. There you go. My synopsis would have been: Prohibition Punisher with a purpose takes his kid sidekick along with him for revenge. <laughs> well, there you go. You did it much better. Why didn't you do the ten cent synopsis? I hate. I was just going to say this. I mean, and, and 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 I think I'll start off with my just my initial thoughts and why I kind of like. I'll be honest. I like the movie more now that I've read the comic book and seen the movie. And and the main reason that I like the movie more is because, believe it or not, for a gangster book, I, I thought it was too violent. It was like Humphrey Bogart being cast in a John Woo movie. Like he was like, there's a scene where he goes to meet. Um, uh, Capone's main uh, capo, I think, uh, Mr. Nitty, he, he basically has to kill, like, I don't know, like 40 or 50 gangsters to get out of this hotel alive. And they call him the angel of death as he's, like, jumping down, you know, the staircase and riding on banisters and double 
guns blazing. And in the movie, it's Tom Hanks, America's dad. And he, he basically kills very few people in this. And it's more of a, a drama about fathers and sons. And so in... Okay, in, are you ready to drop the gloves already? Hit that bell ring because I know that Chad had a different opinion of this. And maybe <laughs> J.A. and Nicole will meet us in the middle. But what's the counter argument to what I just said, uh, Chad? Okay, so... And this might come from the fact that I read the book first before I saw the movie. So I let the book define my expectations. In the book, this guy is such a badass. He's like prototype John Wick. He's sliding down banisters, shooting people. He's pulling out the bare-edged shaving blade and slitting people's throats after they patted him down. He's like, oh, no guns, but he's still got this razor that he's going to cut people's throats with. He does all this badass stuff. And then you get to this movie that is this wonderful movie with this awesome cast, but they cast Puffy Tom Hanks <laughs> as the lead guy. And, and don't get me wrong, like, I love Tom Hanks. Everyone does. It's a requirement in America. But the problem is this guy, the main character, Michael O'Sullivan, the angel of death, is not Tom Hanks. Mm. You need to have somebody in that role that is a soldier that has that look that soldiers get where they're kind of dead inside. Where, like, they're looking at you, but they're not really looking at you. They're just looking 500 yards away, and there's nothing in there. And Tom Hanks does not have that. Tom Hanks handles the part, like, when he goes home and he's a good family man, like, Tom Hanks can do that stuff. But that's not who this guy was. This guy was like, yes, son, you don't want to do what I do because I kill people for a living. But he just doesn't say that part out loud. He says it with his crazy soldier killer eyes. I 100% agree with Chad. Tom Hanks is not the person for that movie. You know, and especially now in the retrospective, an, an additional, what, 20 years of, of Tom Hanks' career, right? Where he's just such the stand-up guy. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense in my mind that he would be the one playing it. I will say the other thing that we really noticed in comparison, you know, speaking of um, different temperament, was Mr. Looney, who in the movie is Mr. Rooney, which does kind of make more sense as a name. But uh, the Paul Newman character has so much more emotion as a father and the conflict over, you know, Michael, who he loves and his son, Connor, who he kind of doesn't, mm. um, he brought so much more to it than in the book. I really liked him, but Tom Hanks just didn't do it for me at all. Yeah. That, I mean, that's why, again, I like the little bit more of the movie Looney in the book. He's just nuts. Like there's that scene where Elliot Ness comes to his his compound in what like uh, New Mexico or something, and he's just like, "Kill him! I want the angel of death dead!" And he's like, his the veins popping out of his neck or whatever. And I'm just like, this guy's unhinged. And you never got that from Paul Newman. Paul Newman is playing the piano, playing chopsticks together. Tom Hanks and Paul Newman. Yeah, and it's and it's gorgeous, and it means so much. Yeah. Like again, it's all about fathers and sons in that 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 movie. I, I, J A hasn't said a lick. What are, what what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I would agree. The graphic novel, the comic, doesn't have this father and son angle that the movie does. But I don't think that's a bad thing because what I like about the novel is that it goes into much more detail of sort of the revenge plot and the whole Elliot Ness government angle and how he's trying to put pressure on the Capones to let the loonies go so that he can just kill Connor Looney. I like that um, how that's handled in the novel the one thing I missed in the novel, though, from the movie was that the connection to his son, I didn't feel was very good. It's just, OK, I'm, you're, I'm taking you along. I've got to protect you. You're going to have to be my getaway driver. But you missed what the movie brought was was that really nice connection between Tom Hanks and the actor playing his son where they're training to do, you know, the bank robberies and everything. You see that kind of alluded to in the novels, but you don't have that. It doesn't have as much pathos. So what I'm hearing is that, I don't know, maybe the best version of Road Perdition is somewhere in between. Like, uh, is that something we could say? Is that there's aspects of the movie that work? There's aspects of the book that work? I don't know. What are people's thoughts on that? I, I think, honestly, it, it's what you're looking for out of that. Because you bring up some wonderful points about how the movie is so focused on father-son relationships as opposed to the graphic novel, which is focused, uh, or focused more on like 
cold-hearted gangsters doing business. For, you know, And like I said, the movie is beautifully shot, uh, but ultimately, they soften a lot of the harder edges for the mm. purpose of that father and son scene. And for me, specifically, it takes a lot of the impact. Not just the badass parts, but I, I liken it to uh, the last Harry Potter movie. They cut out all the stuff that had the emotional impact. And like just showed you these movie battle scenes. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever, CGI crap. But like, show me the Weasleys dying. Show me the stuff that's going to tug at my heartstrings. And here, whenever the gangster puts his wife and his kid into bed after they've been murdered and tucks them in, like... That's not in the movie, and that like that got me. Like, yeah, I was gonna say yeah. I actually, when we watched the movie after, I had read you know the part where the family died was yeah, it was very lackluster in terms of like his response. Like, whereas in the book, I agree, Chad, it was so touching that he like had Michael Jr. say goodbye and tuck them into bed. You actually did see where he was, you know, a family man in that particular instance, and the movie just kind of dropped it. Yeah, his humanity was tied up in that scene in the book. In the movie, right. it's the other stuff. And, and another thing I think that really diverged the book from the movie was, in the movie, the son never shoots anyone. And that was, like, the big thing. That's what my father gave me. He knew I wasn't a killer. I never had to shoot anyone. And in the book, he's shooting people left and right. The kid. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's the kid true. is savage. Yeah. Savage. And then, and then he becomes a priest. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's, that. That is weird. You know, not to spoil the ending of both, but, like, in the movie, he becomes a farmer. In the book, he becomes a priest. And I don't know. I buy more that he becomes a farmer than he becomes a priest because... Well, no, because the book emphasized there was that atonement that the, the father, Michael Sr., saw. I mean, that he talks and they show that they go to churches after he goes on these kind of rampages. And that I, I think it makes sense, actually, that he would become a priest because they that was a big part of his father's kind of, I don't know, routine, so to speak. Well, the one other question that I had, and this is specifically towards Chad, because I, I've done comic book reviews with chads for many many years so i know his thoughts on i hate to say it these kinds of books again the movie right. with the softer edges with more of the emphasis being on the father-son relationships on the human relationships on the relationships between characters versus the book which you kind of commented was pretty much like a punisher book chad you don't really like punisher books like Ooh. you've said that like anytime there's like violence for the sake of violence or this or that, like, nah, that's not really my bag. So it's kind of weird that you're like, yeah, I like the violence book versus the, <laughs> the human interest story. We are not, okay. not the movie. Are you ready for this? Yes. All right. Here's the difference in the Punisher, in John Wick, in those types of stories that really are my bag. The violence is glorified. The violence of, oh, I'm out for revenge and I'm going to kill all these bad guys and watch how they bleed out in front of me and ha ha ha, I'll chuckle as they die and make bad puns and get more weapons and blow more things up. The violence is celebrated. In this, is it calculated? Absolutely. Is it badass? For sure. But it's like, this is not a choice that Michael Sullivan would make if the mafia doesn't take out his wife and son. This is not a choice that Michael Sullivan is celebrating. Even as he trains his son to be a getaway driver, these are all a means to an end. And you, you know it's going to be a bad end for the majority of these characters. I like that it didn't celebrate it or glorify it, but it was a reflection of the time of that Prohibition era. Okay. You know, like sort of like when we read uh, what Torpedo. It's a violent book, but it's a product of the time. It's a product of this horrible... Uh, 1930s, you know, gangster lifestyle or whatever. And none of those characters are going to meet good ends in the end. Um, right. Even that, that was bad people doing bad things. Like, Michael Sullivan isn't doing those things. Like, yeah. it's a means to an end. Like, he wants to avenge his family. Can I jump in with the total chick commentary on the movie? Okay. Can we talk about Daniel Craig and Jude Law? <laughs> Two of the sexiest men alive who are portrayed so differently. And they're so young, I guess that's the thing. But Daniel Craig's like this wimpy little guy. So he's Connor, right? Which, that was very different from the book. Like, I didn't really get crazy out of him. In the movie, he was like 
that wimpy, weak. like, oh, my dad, was my dad weak. never loved me. Yeah, the, the weak yeah. kind of guy. Come on, this is like our James Bond now, mm. of course. And, and obviously that came later in his career, but I can't. I still, like, had a hard time visualizing him as this wimpy, kind of very thin guy. And Jude Law, I have to say, I mean, I, uh, it creeped me out, his long nails. and, and But he did, he did do a really good job of adding something to it. I kind of liked this kind of crazy guy that kind of replaced Connor craziness in the film, right? Kind of sought Michael out even even when he didn't really need to at the end, you know, and he just he he was the one Chad that just wanted to kill for being killed. But that was still hard to take the beautiful Jude Law in my mind and turn him into a killer. <laughs> what I liked about the Jude Law part of the film that was lacking in the novel was that Jude Law became this stalking death. <laughs> he was stalking Michael O'Sullivan and his son. And so there was it created uh suspense. you know fear and suspense, correct. Well, well and it's the like the equal but opposite. He was his venom. You know, the angel of death's own personal archangel of more death. <laughs> Where in, in, in the novel, you didn't have that, that aspect. You didn't have somebody who's coming. I mean, he he was up against the mob's army, but you didn't feel that there was someone personally stalking him as well and that there was real danger in anything he did. He was so badass, so Punisher-like that he was always on top of things. So I think that's what's so shocking about in the novel, especially if you've watched the movie first and you kind of know the ending. You're like, well, there's no one hunting him. So you don't know how it's going to end. And then he just, you know, two pages before the end, he shows up at the house in perdition and boom, he's dead, which I actually liked better, even though I prefer the suspense and the buildup and that continuing dread of the movie. I like that it's just an unexpected nobody who kills him in the book i thought that was much more realistic yeah i i can i can see that in terms of you know just the randomness of crime i i i keep on saying that i like this movie more but i do i think some of the dramatic choices i i like the vulnerability of tom hanks's character in the movie i don't like the fact that sullivan is just on top of things all the time and is always commanding the situation for me that cuts into the dramatic tension it's just this guy running around, and he's going to just shoot more people and rob more banks and whatever. Uh, but in the but you know the system's going to get him. It's going to catch up eventually. It always does. In the movie, Tom Hanks is vulnerable. He has somebody, this Jude Law, who is more badass than him, trying to hunt him. And he he luckily gets a, a a great shot off in the in the uh, in the hotel room and puts glass in his face, which I thought was awesome, and manages to get a getaway. But that that rolling dread, that being the Peter Parker and having an Eddie Brock always on, over your shoulder following you, it, it makes for better drama, better tension. So I'm going to jump in here because one of my criticisms of the the book was the art one i think being in black and white and and there's just a lot of lines and i have trouble sometimes being able to like really see what's happening i don't know it's just i it just doesn't work well with my mind or something but speaking to ja's point that it's kind of like a lot of just random killing against the mob i mean i felt like i couldn't identify really with anyone i mean i couldn't tell who was who and who was what half the time i couldn't even tell who was michael and like oh did he just get shot nope that was someone else i mean i just had a really hard time so it, it thing i'd also say that it was just kind of like okay flip a page more killing more killing more killing okay get to a point where like now okay there's something happening with the story because i don't know the art for me just didn't do it i found myself kind of not even looking at it and just reading the bubbles can i do it can i do it can i do it you can oh nicole this goes back to scott mcleod's understanding comics so excited you brought this up because actually i really did want to talk about this genuinely so this art style is very photorealistic. You almost might say it's almost like photo tracing, right? And so if you go back to Scott McCloud's a triangle between realism and abstract art, the, the closer you get to realism, the harder it is for your audience to find a connection, to find something that's relatable. That's why, like... A lot of really simple concepts, like think of uh, Charlie Brown and Peanuts, where right. they're just circles and Wiggles, dots. Yeah. So many people can relate to circles for eyes than they could with something that's like super detailed, like the art in here. Now, even though I will admit it was inconsistent in times, 
Like, there are some panels where you can tell he's kind of off the reservation. And one of the problems with photo tracing art to me, even when I like it, it can be difficult because real people don't look the same all the time. Right. Like, if, you know, when somebody's looking to the side or looking, you know, down or just whatever, the way the angle of the human body, it doesn't always look the same. And so when you're tracing photographs, characters, it's hard to tell who's who because, like, wait a minute, he didn't look like that in the last panel. Well, that's because the guy didn't stylize it to make him look like the, you know, he made him look more like real life. But with that said, I thought that the artist, the Richard Piers Rayner, who actually had done more work than I had uh, seen earlier, so I should commend that. He did a really great job picking poses and picking moments that brought out that emotion. There were so many just emotional beats that I was able to pick up from this story. You know, when the, when the kid, oh, it looked like a real kid. The kid's tucked in the bed. And it like it it breaks your heart and like oh my god like but at the same time the less abstract it becomes the harder it is to make those connections. Yeah, I think my my problem was more with the fight scenes, right? Like where there were just a lot going on and and whatnot. I do agree that there were some very poignant emoting panels in there as well. I I like the art. I appreciated it. I can see where you're saying there was some inconsistency. And that might just be due to the length it took for the artist to put this together. I believe it was four years he worked on this book. Yeah. So it's not like one of those things where, you know, somebody put it out in a month or two. And so I would imagine that from the start to the end, not only how he draws things going to change a bit, but just, you know, you know, he might have changed styles. He probably didn't do it chronologically, too. He probably picked out certain scenes and fleshed those out and then went back and worked on other stuff in between. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I, I will say this, that I, w- I was a fan of the fact that in the book, uh, Michael, Su- Michael Sullivan didn't have a uh, stingy little pencil-thin mustache. Because <laughs> I didn't, I didn't like, buy that at all. You that, don't like pencil-thin that... mustaches, don't you? you? This is the second time you've brought up that you don't like these pencil-thin mustaches. I don't! I think they're ugly. The one, you know, Tom Hanks looked terrible in it. And uh, I, I, I love the scene in the movie where he goes to the farmhouse and he actually gets, like, a full beard. Because I'm just like, you look better, Tom Hanks. You should have had the beard from the start. <laughs> like, the pencil-thin mustache, it ain't working. That's in a Jimmy Buffett song and that's it so just leave it to me say. <laughs> so in any case we'll be right back with more of uh, the last comic shop right after these messages we're going to get our final grades reviews whatever you want to call it where we uh, assign some value to this book with our final thoughts so stay tuned for that welcome to the this is the channel where we talk nerd, we talk hope, and we speak nothing else. I'm your host, Captain Nostalgia, and I'm so glad that you're here to join us. Victims and Villains is a podcast and YouTube channel that marries pop culture and suicide prevention, producing content with the intent to let people know that there is hope and that there is a better way and that each and every listener has value and worth. Listen to Victims and Villains on your favorite podcast catcher or on YouTube by searching for Victims and Villains. Also, check out their website, victimsandvillains.net. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our ratings, where we take somebody's creative efforts and say, hey, we're going to grade it. It's the final <laughs> evaluation. That's right. <laughs> We're going to assign value to this in some sort of point system so that everyone will know what we really thought of your work, creative person. <laughs> Because that's what critics do, right? This book was published in 1998, so I think they probably are okay. Mm-hmm. That's true. Like they they did ca- later. They did cash in on a movie, so like. Yeah, I think you're overblowing your importance. That's everybody's dream when it comes to making a comic book, whether you can get the movie out of it. That's the real R and D. Any case, uh, uh, for our ratings this week, as always, we do a one out of four scale. And uh, J A, what is our particular one out of four scale for this week? One out of four Tommy guns. <laughs> more than a rat tat You know, every single time I think of Tommy guns, the the first person I always think of is uh, Flat Top from the Dick Tracy comics. Just because I remember that Warren Beatty movie. Oh, that was a great movie. And Flat Top always had the, the Tommy gun. It was the best. 
But in any case, uh, so we're going to do one out of four Tommy guns, and we're going to start with my lovely wife, Nicole. So, Nicole, how many of these Chicago typewriters are you going to be grading on this week? All right, so this is just for the book, right? Yes. Okay. I will give the book two and a half Tommy guns. Wow. It was all right. It's like two Tommy guns with an extra barrel of Yeah, uh, I don't know ammunition. the parts of the gun. That's what I was thinking, though, would be kind of the barrel. A BAR? That was the everybody used to actually use a BAR when they back in the day. Don't interrupt me. Anyways, yeah, so it would be the it would be the the more substance substantive part of the half. Substantial. Right. Yeah, substantial. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's so late, and I drank a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean it was okay. Like I, I think we've all alluded to there were parts of the movie that you know, especially you had seen the movie before you you know kind of try to intermix and I think that's where the the happy medium was for me maybe a little bit from the book a little bit from the movie would have would have made it all good so I'm just going to go for the book itself though two and a half okay J.A. what's your grade on this I'm going to give it a solid three Tommy guns I really enjoyed it I like uh, something that we didn't really get into but uh alluding to the art I love the panel work you know it was very straightforward most pages were four uh, equal panels. Sometimes they would do two panels on the bottom and a single panel on top, or two panels on the top and a single panel on the bottom. Very rarely did you get a full one-page panel spread, and I just felt that it did a very good job of telling very a classic story using sort of classic comic book tropes, you know, layout design. So I'm giving it a solid three Tommy guns. Wow. I like how Johnny Andrew, the graphic designer, totally talked about layout and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so typical. So typical. <laughs> All right, Chad. You are the guy that seemed to do- dote on this book. What are you giving it? So, okay. I, I also want to piggyback on the, the art. Uh, the artist did a masterful job with laying things out and telling the story. And it, it's, it's that much harder whenever it is that photorealistic style. And so I can think of a handful of artists that can pull this off as effectively. But th- there, there's not many. The only thing I wanted to mention that we didn't talk about was there were a couple of homages in here that when I would see them, I'd be like, oh, that's awesome. And then I would lose my concentration for 15 minutes trying to be like, oh, I, got to, I have to Google this. Like at one panel, it looks like the Three Stooges are golfing. <laughs> did you guys catch that? I did, actually. And I'm like, are those the Stooges? And then like, I'm thinking, like, oh, I need to Google that. And then like, very early on, there's a, a, a picture. It's like on page three. It's a photo trace drawing of the picture from Cheers, like one of the pictures at the beginning of Cheers. And so I was texting, and I was like, does that have some important historical significance other than it's from Cheers? <laughs> and like, it was so good, though, but it would take me out of that. But then I, I do want to ding it because, like I said, sometimes it was inconsistent. Sometimes I could see panels where it's like, well, that kid doesn't even look like the same kid. Mm. I don't know what, if he was off model or, or what was going on there. So I'm going to say it's it's slightly over three Tommy guns. I'll go three and a quarter Tommy okay. guns. Like a little, a little, little small pistol, like one of those small... <laughs> yeah, and it read so quickly. Like, boy, once I, I started, I didn't want to put it down, except for those times when I would get sidetracked. Unfortunately, they were easy to get back into after that. Yeah. Well, I think I'll start off with um, kind of mirroring at least that last sentiment that you said. It was an easy read. I mean, I won't lie. Like, originally when I opened this page, I think, and it was close to 300 pages or something like that, I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> I've been with some of those slogs where 300 pages of a comic book uh, will take you all week to read. And I read this in, what, two nights, I think. I read the first two issues the first night. And that's just simply because I was tired and, and I was start, things were starting to bleed together. But it was a really easy read. And I will say, to uh, J.A.'s point, the panel layout of having those big pictures... Um, made it so easy to read. Uh, it seemed like the dialogue was nice and spaced out. Things didn't seem too crammed. Was You were able to spread your legs sometimes uh, with the art uh, style, which, again, doesn't happen with uh, some, some books um, of that length. But I, I will say that as somebody that has adored the Road to Perdition movie, and maybe... That's the reason why I'm kind of critical of the book is because I love that Road to Perdition movie so much. 
uh, the book just didn't match up. It, it just didn't come to the same level. Uh, dr- dramatic tension or, or, or uh, you know, the high drama that I expected. If you had told me that this was a Punisher book, other than the fact that, like, again, Michael Sullivan seems to be a nicer guy than Frank Castle at times, it's still just a Punisher book. You could have done this at Marvel. And and, and, I, and I will say that my, my favorite part of the, of the comic were, were actually the first two issues. Once Elliot Ness jumps in, yes, it makes a, lot more, a little more sense from a historical perspective how, like, yeah, Elliot Ness getting involved with Old Man Looney uh, would have eventually made Capone give up Connor. I, I just didn't care. Mm. I didn't care that Elliot Ness was there. I didn't care what was going on with that particular story. Uh, the Looney character was just a caricature of evil mob boss guy. And compared to the Paul Newman pathos father-son relationship he has with Tom Hanks, it just didn't match up. It didn't measure up at all. So I'm going to say this is sincerely probably a two, a two Tommy Gun book. It's average. It's nothing to write home about. I've uh, I've read better comic books. I've read worse comic books though too. So, uh, but compared to a four Tommy Gun movie, yeah, this this doesn't even compare. So, in any case, uh, uh, as always with our last half of our show, we always like to do recommendations. So here are some other comic books that you can read in your spare time or actually hopefully go out to one of those comic book shops that I hope you still have in your area. And this week, although we do oftentimes comic books in terms of one being similar, one being current, and one at a left field, I feel like all of them kind of have a similar film war kind of crime element to them. So we're going to go ahead and start, actually, with our out of left field pick. So our left field pick comes from Chad this week. Chad, what was our left field pick this week? Okay, so my left field pick comes, as many of them do, from the dollar bin, where fortunately recently it was half price dollar bin books. So these are 50 cents. I know. And so usually if I'm in that situation and I see a series that looks interesting and I can get the whole story, I'll go for it. And so one day I picked up John Romita Jr.'s first creator-owned work. It was a three-issue uh, prestige format miniseries out of Image called The Gray Area. It was written by, I want to say it was a newcomer to comics, by the name of Glenn Brunswick. Pencils by John Romita, Claus John- Jansen, and uh, John Workman did letters on here. And so the story is about a dirty cop whose family gets killed. Oh, familiar trope there. But uh, And so he sets out on revenge. But uh, where it takes a turn is he gets killed rather early. And so he gets sent not to heaven, not to hell, but to the gray area in between. And there it becomes a little bit more of a supernatural. Like he has to work to, to gain his shot at redemption and learn to those important lessons so that his soul can pass along from that gray area. And it's really fun. And you get to see John Romita Jr. Uh, flex some of his uh, demon drawing muscles and his mafia drawing muscles. If you're familiar with his work from Spider-Man, you know how much he likes to draw gangsters. And it, it, it's fun. It's not uh, It's not Shakespeare. I, it's not the, the best thing I've ever read. But at the same time, if you like these styles of stories, and like the first cover even has the, the Scarface homage with the black and the white, but it's really the gray. It's the in-between in the gray area. Oh, boy. Matt. But it's worth tracking down. If you can get it for a buck fifty, like I did, I say go for it. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to J.A. next with our current pick. J.A., what's our current pick for this week? Okay, so our current pick is the current run that just finished up of Spider-Man Noir. This is the 2020 version, ran for five issues. This is by Margaret Stoll and Juan Ferreira as the penciler with cover art by Dave Raposa. Now, Spider-Man Noir, if you are unaware, is a alternate version of Spider-Man that takes place in 1933. He first appeared in 2008 and voiced by Nick Cage in the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie that came out a couple of years ago. So this new series, uh, continuing story, 
of 1930s Spider-Man. So a bit more PG than what we just read, but uh, in a similar vein. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially if you're a fan of, of capes, uh, uh, either track down that new recent series. I, I just always loved in the Spider-Man noir universe, how they reimagined a uh, Spider-Man's rogues gallery, like the vulture being, I think a member of a uh, sideshow freak carnival. And, and it basically yeah. almost part cannibal, like just a neat, neat series so if you can find any of that spider-man noir all of it is is really right. good stuff i will say the newer stuff i'm familiar it's a little bit more fun in nature than the like the first couple spider-man noir runs were pretty dark yeah and i wouldn't necessarily give those to like a kid but right. yeah I, I definitely agree with jay it was it was a fun ride for that one so our similar pick for this week is actually a book that uh, chad and i have already reviewed but it is a fantastic book that was recommended by a local Pittsburgh comic book uh, creator, friend of ours, Mikey Wood, and it's called Torpedo. And uh, I think I mentioned it earlier in the show. Torpedo is a uh, 1930s prohibition gangster type comic book. Uh, it originally came out in the early 80s. It was uh, printed in the Italian version of the Creepy magazine, uh, which is a kind of a horror publication, not only uh, in the United States, but also in Europe. And uh, it is a really, really dark book, uh, but funny at the same time, kind of a uh, if you're in the right mood, um, it definitely has some humorous moments to it. It's a very violent world that Torpedo exists in. Uh, it's pretty much short stories, about 10, 12, 14 pages long per story. And it really just involves Torpedo being asked by some mob boss to go kill somebody. But some of the clever ways that he does it, I, I, I remember when we reviewed this book, it was kind of like the MacGyver of um, hitmen because he would like uh, make this fake arm and sit in a, a, a barber chair and, and use that as a way of, of getting the guy when he came inside or maybe dressed up like Santa Claus and put his uh, accomplice in the sack and, and, and carried him in so that he'd have an extra gunner with him. Just some interesting stuff. A dark book, not recommended for kids at all because it is very violent and very misogynistic towards women. Yeah, uh, to it made me honest. feel icky. I would not recommend it, but it was well done. Yes, it is a product of its time. I mean, it is a mention yeah. of that. And uh, ultimately, the uh, author, uh, Enrique Sanchez uh, Bulli, basically wrote it the entire way. And Jory Bernay uh, did most of the art, although the first two issues are drawn by uh, one of uh, Chad Mai's favorite artists from, from cartoons, primarily, which is Alex Toth. So if you have an opportunity to catch that, it was IDW, I think, released great new translation by Jimmy Paul Palamati, uh, who you might know from other comic books as well. So really great stuff if you're into really harsh, gritty, crime, gangster comics. And so uh, with our kind of cherry on the top this week, we've got Nicole with her recommendation. So, Nicole, what's your recommendation for this week? All right. So my cherry on top is not a comic book. However, uh, it is related to this uh, discussion via Tom Hanks. So <laughs> I have a goal every year of reading 52 books one for each week on average and in 2020 one of the first books that I read that I just randomly picked up in the library I was looking for another book and must have been in the H section by author and I lo and behold found a book by the one and only Tom Hanks and I was like the Tom Hanks Tom Hanks and sure enough, there it was. So he wrote a collection of short stories. It was published in 2017, and it's called Uncommon Type. Um, and that's a little play on words because every short story has a typewriter in it and somehow connects to typewriting. And evidently, he probably wrote all of these things on typewriters. But yeah. I heard about that. He collects typewriters, which was yeah, a weird thing yeah. about Tom Hanks. Yeah, and so there's little pictures of typewriters. And as if Tom Hanks wasn't talented enough, 
he was a phenomenal writer. And I'm not normally a short story person, but I loved this collection of short stories. You know, there were little threads that kind of wove through them, but then somehow were also totally random. But they were so well written. Um, and I really am like, can he write another book soon? Maybe he did when he, you know, was sick with Corona. I don't know. But uh, yeah, so that's my cherry on top. It's a Tom Hanks short story book. Well, there you go. And that's all the time we had for The Last Comic Shop this week. I hope you enjoyed all of our recommendations as well as our review of the uh, Road to Perdition comic book. So now, if you're a fan of the movie, go out to your comic shop and pick up a copy of Road to Perdition. Also, make sure that you favorite yes, review and subscribe to The Last Comic Shop on any of your podcatching platforms so that you never miss one of our broadcasts in future, as well as follow us on Instagram and Twitter so that that you can catch all of our comic book related musings as well as we're always huge huge fans of comic book art so if you're a comic book artist make sure that you follow us so that we can retweet some of your great stuff that you put out there for your fans and remember folks while we may be the last comic shop Chances are very good there's a comic shop near you that could use your support. So don't forget to head out to comicshoplocator.com to find some place near you and, uh, and spread that comic book love and enjoy all there is to be had. And so until next week, folks, stay safe, stay sheltered, and most of all, stay out of the alleys. Because you never know who might be hiding behind that corner with a Tommy gun. Or one of those piano wires. They're gonna get me! And Uncle Sullivan's out to get me! I don't know what's going on! I don't know what's And don't give me the hi hat! The Last Comic Shop was a 2021 Black Angus production.